Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Vlog. And this is gonna be a review for Venom First Host, or like our discussion video, as usual. But I'm also gonna squeeze something else in that came out this week. This is Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number One. And I have the Gabriel Del Otto cover here. There was two different covers, another one with uh, Peter in the foreground with the symbiote like in a jar behind him. Uh, both covers looked really great. I actually like the artwork in this book a lot. It's by Gary Brown. And it was written by Saladin Ahmed, who I'm not familiar with Saladin's work. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, this was, this was my first exposure and I will say, uh, this is something we've kind of seen before, uh, but just, you know, the concept anyway. Uh, so the idea wasn't new to me as a longtime Spider-Man reader and fan. Uh, the concept of this was not new to me, uh, but it was executed. Okay. I, I will say though, it felt like some of the dialogue and some of the, like the description, you know, boxes, like the captions and stuff felt a little weak to me. Um, but uh, overall, uh, there were some good moments in here with Black Cat and Spider-Man. Uh, this is a, an adventure that takes place before Spider-Man gives up the black suit, before he goes and visits Reed Richards. It even ends with that moment kind of being retold, uh, which I wasn't a big fan of that either. Uh, but uh, the, overall, what the storyline is here is that it's uh, Peter Parker, while he's sleeping, the symbiote comes takes over his body and brings him out and fights crime in the middle of the night. And that is not a new concept. We have definitely seen that before. I think there was one version was told in Spider-Man Family, which was like a magazine or a comic that came out around the time of the third Sam Raimi movie. I think it was like 2007 or eight, um, but it was like a, a book that had like anthology stories in it. And one of the anthology stories was a story like this where the suit kind of took uh, Peter Parker for a joy ride. Uh, and then I think there was another story they did that too in one of the, I don't know if it was an annual or if it was a backup story, uh, but there was other time I think one other time where they did something like this so this is not a new concept so when I heard about it I was like well I'll read it to see if it adds anything new but it really doesn't and they try in really bad dialogue to you know give a reason why this was never mentioned before. And for that, I kind of didn't like it either. Uh, so basically the story is just Spider-Man swinging around town. Uh, the suit has taken him over after he's had a conversation with Black Cat and everything. And uh, the suit's taken him over and he runs across some kid. And really it's the symbiote that kind of is, uh, you know, connecting with the kid because Peter is asleep inside the suit. And, uh, and so the symbiote takes the kid, swings him around town, they save a few people, and then drops the kid off like in an alleyway. And then turns out, coincidentally, that Hammerhead was nearby, saw the kid get dropped off, walks over and says, hey, you know Spider-Man? Looks like we're gonna have a conversation. And then uh, goes and basically kidnaps the kid. And so the suit realizes the kid's in danger, and then it decides to go save the kid from uh, Hammerhead. And then of course, you know, the suit does. Uh, Hammerhead has like a, to like a weapon that shoots like sonic vibrations. It hurts the suit a little bit. How it doesn't wake up Peter Parker, I have no idea. I guess the suit kind of suppresses Peter, keeps him asleep, which again, we knew that power existed before. It wasn't new when Donny Cates said it was new. Um, and, then, uh, and then so Peter stays asleep. He gets hit with the sonic blast, but then the suit, you know, gets him back up and they take down Hammerhead and then they save the kid and then they don't arrest Hammerhead but the suit does almost kill him and the kid said hey man whoa don't kill him don't kill Hammerhead uh, and then the suit you know like listens to the kid grabs him takes you know takes off and then they park it in another alley and the kid says look you know you could be a good person I don't think you're Spider-Man he's like I, but whatever you are I think you could be a hero you just can't treat people like that you can't kill people and so it's like I guess another way to implement you know goodness inside the symbiote before uh, you know Peter Parker gets rid of it. Uh, but again, I feel like that kind of cheapens some of P Peter Parker's influence on the suit. I feel like Peter Parker is a good person and that's the influence the suit had uh, of you know wanting to be a hero and wanting to be good. I kind of like that. And so moments like that kind of take away from that. And then of course, to wrap it all up in a bow, there's this moment at the end where, uh, where Hammerhead says, uh, hey, you guys, don't tell anyone about this. Like, you know, like any, all of us take this story to our graves. No one ever hears about it ever again. And it's like, really? Uh, Solid and Ahmed, that's how you wrap that up and, you know, tie a little bow off at the end and explain why this story was never told. Um, even though stories like this were told, they didn't involve Hammerhead, but a story where the suit takes Peter Parker for a joyride. Uh, while Peter Parker's sleeping, those stories have been told before. So this book didn't really, you know, thrill me. I didn't really enjoy it too much, but I did like the artwork a lot. Uh, and so, I mean, I'll probably give Saladin Ahmed another chance. He, maybe he's good at writing other characters. I didn't, I just wasn't sold on this book in particular. And like I said, I don't know anything about the, about Saladin. So, uh, so I'll keep an eye out and maybe, you know, look for another book that he's written and maybe I could, you know, enjoy that one. Um, but this one, I really didn't dig too, too much, uh, to be honest with you, but the artwork is fun. Uh, and like I said, it's not a new story, but if you haven't read those other stories like in Spider-Man Family and you want a story like this, 
I recommend picking it up. And for those of you out there who want the digital code, boom, there's a digital code right there. First person to go to that website and put that code in gets a free copy of the Spider-Man Annual, Amazing Spider-Man number one annual. Um, so now that that's out of the way, let's do the second half of this video with a Venom conversation. So Venom First Host Issue 4. And before we get into this, you know what? Let's give away the digital code, two digital codes in this episode. Boom, there you go. First person to go to that website, put that code in, gets a copy of Venom First Host Number 4. And don't worry, I this is the variant cover. I did get the main cover, but it's being held for me along with the variant of Issue 6, or the main cover of Issue 6. Those are still waiting for me at Golden Apple. I just picked up the variants today. So in, in a week or so, when I have enough money to go back and buy those, I will have those digital codes again to give away, so I'll have a second chance to get Venom First Host Number 4 and Venom Number 6 by Donny Cates. Uh, but today we're going to talk about this one. I like this variant, by the way. It's really cool. Uh, but in this storyline, again, we have our opening image there. I like when they do the image. I'm not a big fan of it when there isn't one, although I wish they would change up the image, but whatever, it's fine. Uh, nitpicky aside, uh, then we start off where the last one left off. We have Venom, uh, you know, not Venom anymore, but Eddie Brock with the offspring symbiote, and he's with Milans, and they're on their way to go fight Tel Car, and they found his destination where he is in his ship. They uh, located it in space, and he is boarding a, uh, like a scroll warship, and he's going in looking for this bioweapon, which we saw at the end of the last issue, he got his hands on. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a bummer for these guys. Uh, and so Eddie Brock and Milans, they're trying to work together. Yeah. And then as they get out into space further and further and they're getting near their destination, Eddie summons the suit. So he's talking to her as Eddie at first, but then he summons the suit and puts it on and then uh, uses his powers to knock her out. He's using the pheromones to uh, to make her fall asleep. And the reason he's doing this is because he doesn't want her to die. He doesn't want her involved. He sees that she's very honor bound. Her sisters were killed. She's on a, a, a mission of vengeance. And I think on some level, Eddie Brock's, you know, he knows what that's like. Him and Venom knew what that was like when they were trying to get vengeance on Spider-Man. And they know it's kind of a hollow mission on some level. So I think he's trying to save maybe what's left of her soul. They don't say so much in this book. This is me kind of winning a no prize or extrapolating things that I'm, you know, sensing from the story. Um, and it feels like uh, the reason I feel like Eddie Brock would do this is because, you know, he never killed Spider-Man and he never killed Aunt May. And that was his redemption moment in the comics. And now you have this moment where he's like, all right, well, this girl is on the verge of getting her revenge and killing someone she hates. And uh, maybe it will lead to her down a darker path. So I'm going to try to do what I think is better for her. Although, you know, it's not his choice to make for her. I feel uh, she is warrior bound. She is on a mission. He shouldn't interrupt that mission, uh, but he does it anyway. That's kind of his, his focus, I guess, is to put her and hide her. And it's a good thing he does, though, because when they get to the ship and they board the warship, uh, he looks through and sees that uh, the, the bioweapon has been released. Even though a lot of the scroll, uh, scrolls were already killed, I thought by Telcar, I guess a lot of them weren't still and they were on the ship. So he released the virus and it's airborne. So obviously now she will die if uh, she walks out there without like some kind of protective suit on. So Eddie left her behind and he's going around investigating the ship looking for Telcar. And unfortunately for him, he does find Telcar and the two of them get into a big fight. A fire breaks out, you know, it's weakening the symbiotes, but the two of them are fighting. Eddie's using the new powers of the offspring to hide, but the, you know, Telcar is like, oh, I can find a way to find you. Don't worry. I can access different things in the suit that it didn't even know it can do. Uh, and then you do get to see the return of the mouth, uh, which is a little weird. I kind of liked it when it was just like a breathing apparatus. Uh, showing the teeth, though, is, is uh, maybe that's Eddie's influence on the suit uh, in a way. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I guess all the suits kind of have teeth and mouths on them too. Uh, but you know, so Eddie's trying to hide, it doesn't work and, uh, Telcar fights him and the two of them go at it pretty hardcore until Eddie, this is probably my favorite scene in the book. Eddie grabs Telcar's ankle and has the suits bond with each other. And then they go into like a psychic realm where the child it, with almost like a nightwing design on his chest is talking to Venom. And they're saying like Eddie Brock's life is in danger and the suit's like, look, he suppressed me. Tell Carr knows how to suppress me. I can't see what's going on. I don't know what's happening. He's using me as a weapon and I can't, you know, break through. And the child's like, please, you know, like mother, father, whatever, you know, like, you know, you need to do this. We need to save Eddie and we need to save me and everyone else. Uh, and we need to prevent this you know, horrible thing from happening. We're supposed to be heroes. And so the suit does fight back and it finds a way to tear through the programming that Tell Carr put into it to suppress it. And and then at that moment is when Milan shows up and she hits him with that electric rod and separates the suit even further. But uh, Tell Carr is like, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm done with both of you. I'm going to fight back. And he takes the electric suit 
uses it on himself and burns off the symbiote completely. And he's like, all right, if you're not going to let me use it, I'm going to kill this thing and I'm going to leave it for dead. And he's like, and now you don't have a weapon. He breaks the electric weapon in half. And he's like, you know, so come at me, bro. <laughs> he's like ready to fight and go down swinging. Uh, but at this moment, uh, he uses the axe part to cut open M Milan's suit because she is wearing a protective suit, like a space suit. And he cuts it so that she'll be exposed to the airborne virus and to get her out of the way. So it's just him and Eddie Brock. But Eddie uses his the child suit to go bond with her to protect her. And at this moment is when Eddie grabs the regular suit and Telcar's like, "Don't worry, it's dead. You're not gonna like you're not gonna awaken it. It's dead. I killed it." And then the suit says, "Nope, playing dead." And it bonds with Eddie. And now Eddie Brock and Venom are united once again. And they, uh, along with uh, Milan's here, who has the baby symbiote wrapped around her to prevent uh, you know, the virus from getting in, the two of them take down Telcar and they confront him. And he's like, look, you may have won, you may have won this battle, but uh, I, I'm not here alone. I use the bioweapon, but there's more of it. And I also you know, signaled my armada. So at the end of the book, Boom, the Kree show up and they surround the warship of the Skrulls. So now, uh, you know, we have one Skrull left, Milans, and she has an ally in Venom, and they are greatly, greatly outnumbered by Kree warriors. And that is how First Host number four ends. And we will find out the conclusion of the story next week when First Host issue five by Mark Bagley, Ron Lim, Paco Medina, and uh, Mark Bagley, all of them working on the art team. It's pretty funny in this book. It starts off with like Ron Lim art and then it goes into uh, some Bagley art. And then I think there's a, a Paco Medina page or two and then back to Bagley for the ending. Uh, so it looks like they're juggling art duties on this to get it out weekly, which I completely understand. Um, but uh, I felt like this book was a little bit stronger than the third issue, in my opinion. I thought it had a, a little bit more oomph in it and it kept me intrigued. And, you know, all the new power thing aside, you know, that kind of starting to get a little old on me where they're like, oh, this the suit can do this now it's like all right i get it you know you guys are trying to add to the mythology i get it but it's getting a little bit tiresome um but seeing the the child in action and seeing that dream sequence thing where they're talking psychically i thought that was pretty cool it was a neat visual to see those two suits and the way the venom suit was drawn kind of reminded me of the ending of spider-man 3 when it was like you know surrounded by the pipes uh that spider-man was hitting and it was like growing you know kind of reminded me of that sequence a little bit uh which if that's good or not i don't know but i just was like oh it made me think of that uh but the series i think is is pretty good I like Mike Costa's take on uh, Eddie Brock and Venom, and I think he writes Eddie Brock pretty well, and for that reason is why I'm locked into this storyline, uh, but it will be interesting to see how this wraps up, because obviously they're surrounded, but I'm curious, does the Kree even care about Telcar anymore? Do they care about his mission? Uh, do they care about, you know, what his goals are? Uh, it'll be really interesting to see how this all pans out in the next issue, and how Mike Costa wraps up his run on Venom officially with the ending of this series. But as always, I want to hear what you think. What were your thoughts on Venom first host number Four. did you get the digital code if you did let me know down below if you got both the digital codes or one of them whatever you did let me know down in the comments below and if you've read both these books i want to hear your thoughts down below and we'll continue the conversation down there thanks so much for watching my show as always like share subscribe all that fun stuff and we'll see you in the future peace